right, so let's do a, a quick summary recap of the B team uh, at ADCC this past weekend, right? So we took six competitors in, and we had Damien as a reserve for 66, but unfortunately no one got injured, so Damien had to cut weight for nothing, which obviously provided us with a great amount of entertainment in the end. It's obviously eased some of our pain. So I'll go through from 66 up, right? So we had Ethan Kralenstein, who had qualified for the 2019 trials, but blew his knee out in the training camp. Actually, it was Damien that blew his knee out in that training camp, so we were worried that might actually happen again, this one. That's what Damien was hoping for. So Ethan's invite carried over, basically. He earned his spot. Mo honored it for the following ADCC, obviously this one, and put him in there. And his first round matchup was Josh Cisneros. And obviously Josh, one of the best, definitely one of the best competitors of that weight class in the world. And it was a very tough match. Ethan, uh, during the points period, actually, well, at the time we thought he took his back and we were like, oh, we're going to win this match. But um, he never received any points because I believe the body triangle lock was actually hidden behind the hip. So Josh, I don't know if Josh knew this or, I mean, because I definitely would have given him points, but after I had it explained to me by the referee, it does make sense why maybe they wouldn't have given it points. But again, that was a crazy moment in the match. I thought that was going to seal the deal for Ethan. Josh ultimately avoided getting points scored and came back to get a, a crazy flying triangle arm block. I think he popped Ethan's arm, but Ethan's crazy. He's back training already. But again, obviously Ethan lost, but Ethan's never in a boring match. That was a crazy match. He's obviously thinking about ADCC 2024. He's hoping to have a obviously incredible run with some super fights and hopefully he doesn't have to uh, do the trials again. Because uh, once you've done the trials and won, it is kind of heartbreaking to have to go through that process again because winning the trials alone is so damn difficult. And Ethan's already won trials twice. So to go back and go through it again, will be tough and then we'll move up to 77 we had nicky ryan in 77 he drew canudo first round and actually we were pretty happy with the way the bracket turned out for that one like i thought canudo would be a good first match for him good sort of warm-up match for his potential second round against mickey galvao because both of those guys have very dangerous arm bars um but leading up to this uh to this adcc it was about a week and a half ago um, Nicky Ryan was rolling with Kenta, uh, who won the Asian trials and was training with us. And he actually tweaked his knee and he uh, injured his meniscus, I believe. His good knee started locking up again and he had to get a cortisone. And now he's, he's over in Florida now getting an MRI. So we'll find out on Friday what the damage is. But obviously, Nicky had a pretty good camp. This was his comeback match after one and a half years off. Feels so long. His last match was against Dante Leon was I believe the same weekend the DDS split up. That's how long ago his last match was. He's had two knee surgeries since then, and now he's potentially looking at a third one, which is obviously terrible for a guy that's only just turned 21. Obviously, jiu-jitsu takes a, a heavy toll on the body. Nikki was able to persevere. He had a tough weight cut. Obviously, he's quite a thick guy, so getting to 77 was quite difficult with his diet of uh, hot pockets. Um, but he was able to get down we hit, uh, obviously we are using the sauna. We had a sauna at the Airbnb and stuff. We got him there and it was actually difficult because obviously he hurt his knee, couldn't train. Um, we got him a, a cortisone shot and he went out there against Canudo and in the, uh, early in the match, I thought everything was going to plan. He was sort of dominating the hand fight, took Canudo down, but he really fatigued himself in that match. And it's hard to say what's the cause of that, but I would definitely say a few factors are involved. Obviously, first match since the team broke up that first match back in front of 12,000 fans first batch back since two knee surgeries so despite all that obviously we're happy with his performance um and we really just hope that his knee's okay and we're going to find that out on friday because i mean to have three knee surgeries at 21 just just terrible usually that's like uh something happens a bit later in life but even if he does have to have another surgery i don't think it's something he can't come back from and so we also had in the 77 killer division uh kenta from japan so i first met kenta years ago at a seminar in japan since that point he won trials in the 66 division and uh previously at the asian trials uh this year he was able to beat one of our guys joseph chen and he won the asian trials the bad part 
about winning Asian trials is you typically get the number one seed. We're the lowest ranked trials amongst Brazil, obviously Europe, uh, and the US and Canada. So he had JT Torres first round, but he actually did crazy good against JT Torres. He was able to take him down. And I, I was so impressed by him. JT, I mean, Kenta trained with us for probably two months leading up, and I think uh, he had moved into MMA. And so from the previous time I saw him at 66, I believe he got taken down by Paul Meow. to now he's able to take JT Torres down. So the improvements he made from 180cc to the other are crazy. And obviously we're gonna miss Kenta. Kenta, we left him in Vegas. Hopefully he's still alive out there. Hopefully he hasn't run out of money, been trapped in a strip club somewhere. But Kenta uh, is flying back to Japan, but hopefully we'll, we'll see him soon. Again, I just think it's crazy that a Asian trials winner had such a tight match with JT Torres and was able to wrestle with him so well. And then we move up to 88 kilo division, my old division. I moved out of this division to avoid three of us being in that division. Cause again, if I had stayed in 88, it would have been Jay Rod Isaac first round. And that would be sad. Two training partners, two close friends in their first ADCCs doing a training camp together only to fight first round, which is sort of seems a bit rough. So that's part of the reason I moved up to 99. But we'll go through Isaac first. Isaac had a match against Wagner Hosha, and it was a grueling match. I would say one of the most back and forth, exciting matches of the weekend. Some things I'd take away from that match is while Isaac's cardio was good, he was winning most of the wrestling exchanges with Wagner. The unfortunate aspect was how hard it is to secure two hooks on Wagner. He was able to get one hook, but really just couldn't get the second hook. And then the same with Wagner on Isaac when, uh, Wagner was able to get to Isaac's back and make him turtle. I don't even believe Wagner could really get one hook, but it was a crazy back and forth match. Um, and if there was anything in that match that I think maybe pushed the referees to Wagner was sort of the body language. I felt like maybe Isaac's body language displayed that he was a bit more tired. And one mistake that I think he made just mainly because of the crowd was he actually raised Wagner's hand before the referee decision, which is, I would say, as nice as that is, you really, in a tight match, you can't do anything like that. Because you've got to remember, if the judges are confused and they look up and one guy's raising the other guy's hand, they're probably going to lean towards that guy. But obviously, Isaac's first ADCC, first performance, well, really any jiu-jitsu athlete's performance in front of such a huge crowd. But obviously, very impressed with how he did. And I think uh, going forward, he's easily going to win the Asian trials again and really going to dominate. 2024 ADCC. J-Rod went in there. J-Rod's very happy about his performance against Pedro Mourinho because he did better than me and he's telling me every day that he's now better than me. But J-Rod, I thought Pedro would be a tough match for him because obviously Pedro's got such a scary uh, guillotine and J-Rod can be reckless at times and reckless in the best uh, possible way because he has some of the most exciting matches out there and they really had a back and forth match. Pedro was able to pass him uh, he obviously fought off the buggy choke. Um, one of those times, passed the next time and secured points. One thing we have to do with J-Rod is we have to lie to him about when time's going to run out. J-Rod always almost wins the match in the last 30 seconds. So I think if we lie to him and mislead him about how much time's left, he will start that final push earlier and he might actually get points because when the match ended, he lost by it one point but he was so close to passing Pedro. He was in three-quarter mount. So again, if we lie to him about when the match ends, he's gonna have that little bit of extra time to, uh, uh, to win the match. And really, yeah, crazy performance against Pedro. Pedro is obviously one of the best guys in the world. Uh, no gi, IBGF absolute champ. j Rod's literally been training two, two and a half years. So I think uh, j Rod has some of the best potential out of the entire team because he really doesn't have a huge amount of jiu-jitsu knowledge, but on game day, he just shows up and he always fights to the bitter end, which is obviously incredibly impressive. It's why he's one of the biggest fan favorites out there. And then we move up to 99. 99, I was able to secure silver again. The goal was attained. Uh, first match of the day, Joe Costa. I was worried about this one just because he's uh, He's very good at playing the game and somewhat inactive at times. He's very good at being inactive without uh, receiving stalling penalties. But I just wanted to attack him from the opening bell. Went for a, a Choi Bar arm saddle style submission uh, and his arm just popped and buckled. And it looked, it was sort of like a Udi Gatami kind of thing where he 
he didn't really turn with it, which meant he got uh, armbarred in that position. And I think it was a 15-second armbar. Unfortunately, Gordon beat that fastest submission record. I thought I had the trophy and that prize money in the bag, but Gordon was able to uh, rob that, take that away from me against Roosevelt Souza. Second match, Kyle Bame. Kyle Bame's been calling me out for years. He's always wanted this match. I've never wanted it because he always wants EBI overtime, and he's one of the best in the world at EBI overtime. So I was quite excited to get a match against him under this rule set. And Kyle came out, pulled. The goal was to fatigue him. Kyle's like, he's quite a jacked guy. And he sometimes he appears quite stiff out there. So I thought I could take advantage of that by applying consistent pressure on top without fully committing to a pass to fatigue him. Uh, that worked and he stood up with me. Uh, if you see someone playing guard and stand up, usually it means they're getting tired on bottom or getting frustrated. So he stood up and then he shot a double leg in uh, the points period and I was able to secure a, a guillotine on him, which is funny because ADCC 2019, I secured the same guillotine against Mason Fowler at the same match of the day to take me into the semifinals. And then the next day, Nicholas Merigali, obviously a lot of pressure in this match. I won't just say for me, I'll say for him as well, because it's crazy that my former, to see my former coach in the coach's chair, he knows everything about my game. He knows a ton of stuff uh, that he taught me, obviously. And he even knows a lot about, obviously, my personal mindset and sort of how I compete and how I emotionally deal with competition. So I felt a great deal of pressure. I came out, I wanted to heel hook him straight away. Merigali said he was gonna submit me in three to four minutes. I wanted to submit him immediately into the match. So I went for the kill straight away. Got a few leg entries. His heel hook defense was good. My pacing was off. This was, uh, it was, I was grappling with pure emotion there. So I was too aggressive, really fatigued myself. So I had a few opening attacks, ended up using a leg entry to come on top, stuck in his closed guard for a while. And then he stood up and we sort of had uh, we went, we're wrestling until overtime, then we went into overtime and wrestling again. I was absolutely exhausted. In this match, I really regretted doing minus 99 because I was like, man, this guy's big. Like, I was probably 211, 212 for that match. He's a big guy. He's cutting down. He's not overly jacked, but he really is just that. He is just that weight class. You know what I mean? He belongs in that weight division. He's not artificially ballooned up. And I saved energy to the last minute. I was like, don't get a stalling penalty. You got enough energy for one good shot. I took the shot, I was able to put him to a hip, and I think that was probably the decider of the match. He picked up single legs, but he was just picking them up to look busy. But really, he didn't make a sincere effort to take me down. I shot the double, put him to a hip. Luckily, the referees uh, gave it in my favor on that one. Final match of the day, Kainan, literally uh, a fucking gorilla. I went out there, it's just, he's so different from even a year ago. Like now he, he has the Andre Gavao back, everything. I remember he hugged me before the match. I was like, I've made a mistake doing minus 99 kilos. I felt his back. I was like, this guy's enormous. Obviously out there, as you guys could see, even on the feed, he was snapping me when I was fully upright in good posture. I was like, that's a problem. I allowed him, well, I didn't really allow him. I just didn't defend it too hard when he wanted to take me down because I can't pull guard in uh, a final. And then when he got on top of me, I thought I'd have a lot more success creating off balances. I thought I could get to the legs. I saw his knee was taped up. I was like, hopefully I can get to that bad knee. But I just, I couldn't move, just couldn't do anything to the guy. And obviously it's, he's not just strong. It's all technique as well. You know, like when, when technique's equal and one guy's literally that much stronger, it's just so hard to get anything going. And the referees, I paid them quite a bit of money prior to the match to give him to give out those uh, penalties. And at one point I was even up. But I say this sincerely, if I had won via penalties, I wouldn't have taken that gold medal. I would have given it back to him because that's, that's, that's really no way to win. And then again, the crowd were booing him, but yeah, he was, he was just doing what he had to do to win in the safest way uh, possible. The crowd was very funny during the match, yelling out some funny things. At one stage, someone said something about my OnlyFans. I started laughing, I looked at Kynan, he wasn't laughing at all, you know, so it really didn't have much effect on him out there. But again, hats off to Kynan, he has encouraged me to move back down to 88 kilos. And then finally we get to Nicky Rod. Nicky Rod did weight and absolute. The first two matches of the, of the day, uh, his first match was against a, I believe a wrestler. I don't believe this wrestler won trials, I believe it was sort of a last minute replacement. But it was, uh, Nicky Rod used that as a bit of a warm-up match. 
looked great out there. Second match, John Hansen rematch from another trials event where he actually cartwheeled, took John Hansen's back and choked him. This time there was no cartwheel, but he still took his back and choked him. But again, John Hansen, uh, another incredible, incredible athlete out there. He looked really good uh, winning trials, I believe East Coast trials. Day two, he has Philippe Penner. Philippe Penner was a bit of a, uh, not a lot happening in that match early, but then points period hit, Nicky Robb was able to secure the body lock. Uh, almost unstoppable once he locks his hands around you. You really have to avoid that at all costs. Because uh, once the hands are locked, he pretty much always passes. He's so good from that position. The combination of hip dexterity, arm length, head position just makes his body lock, pro I think, probably the best body lock pass in the world. Final match, everyone was super hyped for this one. Obviously, former teammate uh, against Gordon Ryan. Unfortunately, he came out, he took Gordon's bait and took him down. He probably shouldn't have taken the bait. But at the same time, if Gordon's hopping around on one leg for the first 10 minutes of the match and you're not doing anything, you're going to kind of look like an idiot. So it's like, it's a gray area. It's a gray area with the ADCC rules, how you cannot pull guard in the final. And you obviously get things like that happen. Nicky Rod got kind of stuck in a half guard entanglement. And I think he was uh, a bit overly defensive here. And he tried to pull his leg out ultimately leading to a little form of back exposure, but his leg was still stuck. Gordon brilliantly transferred to, the, uh, to a heel hook style position, kept him in a gray, hair, gray area, he kept control of the toes. Ordinarily, if I attack Nicky Rod's legs in the gym, I can barely keep a hold of him. He just explodes out. So it was interesting to see how uh, sort of strong Gordon was at keeping the leg there. And really that, that toe control sort of made Nicky Rod panic and Nicky Rod really was worried about injuring his leg in the process. Nicky Rod comes back for Absolute. Uh, first round of Absolute against Andy Varela. Obviously, much big uh, size discrepancy there, but having Percy train with Varela, Varela's really quite strong for being such a small guy. So they went toe-to-toe -to -toe for a while, and it was kind of close on the feet, but again, as soon as points period hits, Nicky Rod takes it up a gear, looks to secure the points, and I believe it was quite a large point deficit in the end. Second round against Yuri, really a toss-up of a match. Um, Yuri just was a bit more aggressive at some points, looking a bit busier, and ultimately, again, nothing happened. No one really got a hold of that, each other in any way, so it's like it's hard to decide how a decision should go. Ultimately, they give it to Yuri Samos. It was a rematch. When Yuri pulled guard, WNO, Nicky Rob was kind of all over him wasn't able to deal with the body lock. Um, but on the feet in this particular situation, neither of them really got any attacks going. But I believe Yuri just pushed it harder. He pushed it a bit harder. He made a bit uh, more deliberate movements there and that really, really gave him the decision there. And Yuri was able to go on to win the absolute. Obviously very impressive. I think a lot of people had written Yuri off at this point in his career, um, unfortunately. But for him to come back and win the absolute division, very impressive. And uh, it's no prize, but he will have Gordon Ryan for 2024. Uh, for the people asking, I didn't do the absolute because I was exhausted from facing um, Merigali and from facing Kainan. I'm going to do another ADCC, and this time hopefully I can beat my division so quickly that I will have enough energy for the absolute. And I think a lot of people need to appreciate the guys that have four matches, you know what I mean? The guys that either win their division or lose in the final that still do the absolute. That's potentially eight matches in a weekend there. And it's like eight matches against the best, best guys in the world. So it's like for the guys saying, why didn't you do it? It's, man, it's, it's grueling. I had Merigali and Kainan. Kainan, a gorilla on me for so long. One thing I will say is it would have been interesting to see Kainan in the absolute, I'm not sure too many guys would have been able to hang with him. But yeah, his, his knee was quite badly damaged. But yeah, I think me personally, I think that's one guy that is one of the few guys out there that can actually have a good match with Gordon. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be a tall order for Yuri Samoz. But uh, Kain and Gordon, it, to me personally, at this point, is really the only interesting match I can see in the foreseeable future. Last words, last words on the team. We've got a new motto at B Team. Uh, we're not here to take over, we're here to take part. <laughs> we're still in the McGregor line. <laughs>